I would like to greet you in the Polish house, thanks to the PKO and PESA2 companies that uh, envisioned this part of Polish soil in Davos just for a few days. Um, so thank you for their um, hospitality. Um, today we're going to discuss a pressing matter of taxation. My name is Peter Arak, I'm the head of the Polish Economic Institute, um, a think tank in Warsaw. Um, uh, we pr present a paper today. Uh, you're not going to see it, you're going to view a video, but I'm giving the voice to... I would like, you know, uh, first of all, I would like to introduce, uh, I would like to welcome our honored guest, uh, Mr. Mateusz Morawiecki, the Prime Minister of Poland, Secretary General um, uh, Jose Angel Guria of the uh, OACD, and uh, uh, Bruno Le Maire, the Prime Minister of Finance and Economy of France. <laughs> Astonished guests, ministers of the Polish cabinet, heads of uh, Polish institutes, and uh, other members of the uh, probably elite, uh, uh, somehow elite of the world. Um, I give to you Beata uh, daszyńska muzyczka the head of the, po uh, the Polish Development Bank, who's going to give her opening speech to this discussion. Good evening. Dear Mr. Prime Minister, dear Mr. General Secretary, dear Minister of Finance, dear Minister of Finance, Dear ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and pleasure to open this high-level discussion, high-level discussion devoted to the problem of the tax unfairness. This high-level discussion was organized by, co-organized by Polish uh, Economic Institute and the Polish State Development Bank. We all know that unfair taxes practices are among the mass demanding business and economic challenges of modern days. You may ask, however, why this issue is so interesting for Development Bank? Why do we support this project? Our mission is to enhance economic and social development of Poland. We carry out our mission supporting Polish entrepreneurs in all phases of their growth from small to medium enterprises to local and then international expansion. We know the challenges faced by our clients and partners, and we perfectly understand the need of level playing field, both for local and international competition. Bringing back to state treasury 500, 600, billion dollars, which every country lost yearly globally. By state governments, it is not only the goal of the fighting against unfair tax uh, practices. Success of this fight is also a basic preconditioning for tax system to be really equal for the small and for the big ones. It is a basic precondition for tax system to be really based on the princip principles of solidarity. Level playing field for the smallest and the biggest is especially important for the economies of the central and eastern part of European Union. This part of European Union still fighting with the legacy of the communist times. The model of sustainable economic development of our countries has to rely more on local enterprises. Most of them still have to build economic strength and capacity to compete on the regional and global markets. They have courage. They have quality. They have our support. What they need now? They need now equal opportunities for all. I strongly believe that type of meetings and discussion like that today will lead us to solution that we need globally and not only in the European Union, globally. I think that 
this discussion, it is very important. Step toward build deeper solidarity in this topic. Thank you very much, and I invite you for the short movie, which shows you some more information from our report together with the Economic Institute, Polish Economic Institute, and I believe it will be some inspiration how to find a way to resolve this problem. Thank you very much. How do European tax havens work? Imagine a large, prospering international corporation. Let's call it We Don't Pay. We Don't Pay is doing well for itself and generates substantial amounts of profit. It operates in your country and it ought to pay its taxes there, thus giving back to the community it's profiting thanks to, right? Though it ought to work that way, We Don't Pay doesn't want to pay taxes. How does it do it? This is the part where tax havens come in. Some of these are conveniently located right in the heart of the European Union, right under the nose of the European Parliament. Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Ireland. Others, like Malta and Cyprus, are just beyond, in the sun-kissed Mediterranean. We Don't Pay registers a small company in one of these havens, a legal entity usually consisting of nothing more than a PO box. This is the mother company, an entity generously paid by We Don't Pay. What is this mother company paid for? Most often for services which are difficult to value. Services might include the use of a logo, logistical or managerial work. The mother company might also extend high interest loans, which We Don't Pay pays back. All of this is done with one aim, to turn a substantial part of its profits into untaxed costs. The untaxed profits of We Don't Pay end up in Belgium and the Netherlands, where thanks to the helpful legislation of those countries, it is transferred on to traditional tax havens like the Cayman Islands or Panama. All traces of the money disappears there. Almost all of the profit leaks out, untaxed, beyond the borders of the EU. Why does We Don't Pay do that? Because it can. This entire process is legal. And though legal, it's a racket that is costing member states over 170 billion euro a year. Yup, that's over 170 billion euros every single year. Is this what European solidarity is all about? We need to act now. TaxSolidarity.eu Okay, thank you very much. You've seen a very short summary of a report, which is here. Uh, so everybody grab a copy if you don't have it. You also can download it on the webpage here. You also can see other movies, glimpses and podcasts. Uh, about the um, um, issues connected with tax havens. Also, the report has more information, not just those few. Um, um, I'm going to moderate the debate, which everybody is waiting here for. So I would like to introduce the Prime Minister of Poland, Mr. Mateusz Morawiecki. Please come on the stage. Thank you very much. Uh, Secretary General of the OACD, Jose Angel Guria. Please come also here, and uh, the Minister of Economy and fin Finance of France, Bruno Le Maire. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for um, uh, uh, getting over here to discuss uh, this, I think one of the most hot topics uh, discussed each year, uh, yet nobody tries to find uh, a working Sometimes solution for it. Mm, last, uh, I'm going to ask a question to you all, of, all of you three. Um, please be short because you're going to have a chance to give your arguments and then later on uh, in the debate. Um, a report prepared by the European Commission and also one prepared by the European Parliament set and identified six member states, uh, which could be classified as tax havens of basic, basing on the objective data. Uh, we present in our paper uh, an amount of approximately 170 billion euros um, of taxes shifted uh, throughout the world from European companies, European tax payers basically, because it's, we're, we're talking about tax authorities. What can be done in order to uh, harmonize tax policies within the European Union or even within the developed world? I don't know. Prime Minister? 
Thank you. Uh, I think how important the tax system is, we've proven over the last couple of years, uh, repairing this um, and repairing its critical knots. Uh, in, in the context of VAT, Poland was one of the um, weakest uh, in tax gathering amongst all the member states of the European Union, with a gap exceeding 25-27% in the years predecessing 2015, and today we are amongst the best, around 8 or 9 percent, according to the um, European Commission stats. This is, this is truly uh, the game, this was a game changer for our economy, and if here in Davos and uh, a couple of hours ago in Japan, I'm asked why was this possible to have such a strong economic growth over the last couple of years, number one, uh, in, uh, and not only in terms of the level of growth, but also well balanced. The single, the single reason for this is this changes in, uh, uh, in the taxation system and actually lowering taxes, corporate income tax for small and mid-sized enterprises we've lowered from 19 to 9%, uh, while at the same time uh, trying to eliminate all the abusive clauses misused schemes, Irish, uh, Dutch, sandwiches as the lawyers call it, and stuff like this. Uh, so we, we have done our part. Uh, and now I think it's, it's uh, uh, another very good chance to improve uh, revenues across the European Union, across different member states, through uh, con cr cr European-wide uh, initiatives. And this is why I'm so eager to read all the reports which are produced by OECD in the first place. And thank you, Angel, for all your good work in the, the whole base, er base erosion profit shifting report and methodology which you have prepared is, is also a game changer. So thank you for this. But the European Commission should take the bull by the horns and start uh, appropriate actions to eliminate all the gaps, all the VAT carousel frauds and missing trader links and, and other actions should be taken to uh, eliminate all the um, irregularities, let's put it like this. Because this, I even if we can imagine that this could bring half of this amount which was shown here, and the European Commission is actually showing even bigger gap uh, in VAT, around 150 billion, and, and a corporate income tax, 160 billion, which is roughly amount of money the same as the uh, roughly the same amount of money as the annual budget of the European Union. So can you imagine we start really addressing those issues, then uh, the chances for a, a bigger budget of the EU uh, would be much higher. And if we want to have an ambitious EU policy around innovation, around climate policy, the Green Deal, and so on, and here I'm on the same page with President Macron and, and uh, Bruno uh, here. We speak about this uh, uh, quite often. I think we should have ambitious budget behind. How to, how to bring new money into this budget? I think through eliminating at least partially those irregularities and frauds which are behind this report. Thank you very much. Secretary General. Uh, I think it's it's important for you to you know for us to distinguish. Uh, one is tax evasion, which means given certain rules, given certain laws, because our enforcement is either weak or because we do not have. Uh, enough tax inspectors, or because uh, there are problems in the enforcement, or because we have a, you know, just a, this, this competence, skills, etc. We may not be complying with the obligation and at the same time not enforcing the existing laws. The other one is about changing the laws, because the laws today allow for not paying taxes. And you have to distinguish two cases. 
The first one has to do with individuals. Individuals have to pay taxes, the laws are very clear, and they use every possible way not to pay taxes, they take the money away to, you know, to um, tax havens, etc., etc. And there, what we have to do is strengthen the enforcement, and I will tell you what we have done and the results that we have done. And the other one, it's a much more complex. Most of the companies that do not pay taxes, do not pay taxes legally, quote unquote. It may be wrong, but it's not illegal. Whereas with the people, we are basically talking about people who are trying to avoid and evade tax issue, okay? So, what have we done about the first part? Individuals that want to avoid taxation, taking the money out of the country, going, well, after many, many years of working and we are going, going for something called information on request. Now we have automatic exchange of information. What does it mean? 100 jurisdictions in the world today automatically are exchanging information. Why? Because you create an account anywhere in the Caribbean or whenever in, in any country in the world, uh, in the Pacific, uh, some island or whatever. In the, the bank immediately, by law, will inform the Minister of Finance. The Minister of Finance will inform the Ministry of Finance of the country of the citizen that created the account. Where are we today with this? 50 million bank accounts have been exchanged already. They are in the desk of the tax authority, of Turkish uh, tax authority for the Turks, and of Italians uh, for, the, for the Italians, and the, for the Mexicans, and for the US, and for the French, and everybody else, for the Polish. Okay, so, and you know how much these 50 million bank accounts are worth? About 5 billion euros. Billion, sorry, mistake. That would be a lot of money. These are worth five trillion. That means one third the size of the US economy. This is the size so far that we have found. And what has happened? Now people are saying, know where to hide. So they know that they're going to, the name is going to show up. So what they do? Mr. Taxman, in the hypothetical case of a hypothetical citizen uh, created a hypothetical account, hypothetical bank, you know, I forgot, uh, my assistant did not send a copy to you, you know, uh, a terrible situation, big mistake, what can we do? You say, well, we can give you a new uniform, one that has some stripes like this, you know. The, the, or the, remember, ministers of finance, and I speak only for myself now, but uh, you know, we don't want to put people in jail. We want to collect taxes. Eventually, we put a few people in jail simply to show example, but we basically want to collect taxes. So, how many taxes have been collected so far of these people who have gone there to say they wanted to, 102 billion. So please, 50 million bank accounts worth 5 trillion euros, but already having generated 102 billion, 102 billion of taxes that are, have been paid, quote unquote, voluntarily in these windows of opportunity that have been opened, okay? 25,000 tax rulings have been made public, and one third of the total balances of international financial centers have been reduced. Why? Because they say, why do you need to take it to, uh, you know, 
Kiribati or to Nauru or whatever it is, you know, to hide it. If in any case the name is still good to go because Kiribati is reporting and Nauru is reporting. And of course, all the financial centers are reporting. So, so this is one story. It's working, it's happening, nowhere to hide. The other one is companies. With 15 pillars of working with the companies. And on those 15 pillars, we basically have said, uh, we have succeeded in working with breakdown of country by country, profits, etc. Uh, you know, don't go shopping around for the best treaties possible and things like that. So, where are we? The potential for that is up to 250 billion euros per year that are not being collected, that are st right now just being lost. So, we hope to get a large chunk of that. Uh, the system is about to go, to start. And then last but not least, the one single area where we have not finished the homework completely is on digital taxation. And maybe that's for the next chapter. Thank you. Thank you. Bruno Le Maire. Thank you. I think that uh, most of the key points have been already said by uh, the Prime Minister and by uh, the General Secretary. I just want to add maybe some uh, few remarks. The first one is a political one. The issue is a key issue from a political point of view because tax evasion feeds populism everywhere in Europe. When you are a single person or a family living either in Warsaw or in Paris, earning, let's say, 2,000 euros per month, you have to pay your due taxes and there is no possibility of evading your national taxation. That's totally impossible. You have to pay your VAT for each good that you are buying, and you have also to pay a revenue tax for your incomes. No possibility of escaping the taxation. That's fine for the finance minister, but it is very hard to understand for those people that the biggest companies of the world do have the legal possibility to evade a fair taxation. So if we want to avoid populism rising everywhere in Europe, we need to address the issue. And I really prefer to have the 170 billion euros in the banks of the EU, in the EU budget, or in the Polish or the French budget, instead of having it in the Caribbean islands. My second point is that it's, first of all, up to the nations to fix the issue. And uh, I want to convey what has been made by uh, my friend Mateusz in Poland, because he has been very efficient in collecting VAT. That's a key point. If you, have, you want to have a strong state, you need to have strong public finances, and you need to be able to collect taxes. That's something that works very well in France. Sometimes we are under critics, but we are very efficient in collecting taxes. And that's very important for the sake of fairness and efficiency of the state. Then I think we could improve on this second point, the cooperation among EU member states. And that's very important to have a better cooperation among EU member states about the way we are collecting taxes, changing the rules, changing the implementation of the rules to be sure that everybody is in a situation to collect the due level of taxes. My third remark is um, about the race to the bottom. And uh, Mateus just raised the issue, I think it is a key issue. We can't have a strong EU without any tax harmonization. I'm fed up with the differences of taxations in Europe. Of course, I can understand that there is two or three points of difference between some of the member states. But sometimes, when you are looking at the corporate taxation, you can have 20 points of difference between some of the member states. Which means that you will have a huge company which will be in France or in Poland taking the benefit of the French or the Polish customers, making huge profits thanks to the Polish or the French customers. 
but then putting its profits, not in France, not in Poland, but in another member state, just for the sake of escaping the level of corporate tax in Poland or in France. I cannot accept any more to have any race to the bottom on taxation in Europe. And I think that this taxation dumping is really very harmful for the harmonization and the reinforcement of a sovereign Europe. That's why with President Macron, we are fully determined to change the rules. Today, if you want to change this, you need unanimity. We want to have the decisions on taxation issues in Europe to be decided by a, major, by a qualified majority instead of unanimity. And we will push that proposal, and uh, I hope that we will have the support of Poland on this, because this is key. We can't have such differences among the member states on the question of taxation, and we don't want to go the way of a race to the bottom, because otherwise we run the risk of not having the necessary funding, public funding, to fund public goods like schools, universities, or hospitals. The very last point is about digital taxation. That's a different issue, but I just want to mention it because we are working very hard with Angel to uh, find a compromise with our American friends, and I think that we are not far from getting a final agreement on this question of uh, digital companies. The question is very simple. You cannot accept to have a level of taxation for the digital companies, which are the biggest in the world, 14 points less than the level of taxation for the other companies, including the smallest companies in Europe. Just because digital companies do have and do make profits in Europe without any physical presence. That's the key. And we need to address that situation because the new economic model is based on the biggest companies making huge profits without any physical presence. And if they do not pay the due level of taxation, it won't be efficient and it won't be fair. I think that we are not far from getting a compromise with the US. That's fine. I think that's very good news for all of us. But the key purpose of all of that is to build a new international taxation system for the 21st century that must be more efficient and fairer for the people. Thank you. And you, you um, think in my mind, because um, um, uh, I just wanted to ask uh, uh, Angel Aguria about the same um, thing. So OACD is one of, is one of those institutions, international institutions, which as it's at its heart has fighting tax evasion um, and uh, has some groundbreaking uh, works uh, being uh, conducted in the negotiations. Where we can, when, uh, because this is, you know, me as, a, as an uh, um, analyst uh, uh, being, this, this interests me the most, when we can expect some kind of even soft law, because these are going to be recommendations, not um, laws that we have to introduce into international community, uh, when, we, when we could uh, see, uh, you know, the finish line of those. Uh, Let me first tell you who is participating in this definition? 137 countries assembled under what we call the inclusive framework, which means every single country is on the same footing and is participating at its own choice in the different techni technical uh, work and then of course joining the conclusions and joining the let's say the ownership of the product how long have been we we been working on this in this last stage about digital taxation specifically since 2018 uh, officially since 2017 unofficially, so basically three, three years on the technical work, two years on the uh, official work since we got the mandate. This is a G20 mandate. We are on time for the work. 
The next meeting is on the 29th and the 30th of January. This is in a few days. Then we will be working on technical stuff for the next few months and the next big meeting of the inclusive growth, 137, plus the task force on digital taxation, which is a, a subgroup of this. This is going to be in the, the so-called steering committee, which is a subgroup of the subgroup. You know, instead of 137, then you have about 24 countries that prepare things and then present them to the 137. Then this is by end of June, July, where all the elements of the package of the solution of the roadmap should be ready. And then from the middle of 2020 to the end of 2020, we should work in putting together the platform for implementation. So we are on schedule, we are on calendar, but we are facing a situation which you all will understand. There is a political imperative in every single country to say it's not possible that some companies, because they are dealing with this technology and so sophisticated, do not pay taxes. Because of what uh, Mr. Minister Le Maire said, like individuals who are captive, the small and medium companies are captive, but the big guys, you know, are basically free to move the profits from everywhere. And the, so what, what is happening here? Everybody is saying, well, okay, work on it. You know, OECD, we help you, we support you. We send our best and the brightest te technical people, etc. But please, you know, this requires a lot of expertise, but a lot of political will. And in the end, a great spirit of compromise. If at the end of the year you do not have a deal, we reserve the right to go and do our own national thing. So the two reasons why we should have a national, uh, an international solution, a multilateral solution, is because the ownership, the sharing, everybody will be more committed, but because the alternative is so cacophonic and so noisy that we will have 40, 50 countries all under the uh, political imperative of saying, I cannot accept politically that one company does not pay or the biggest companies do not pay taxes. Therefore, I just have to do it. So we believe we are going to deliver on these dates uh, be, uh, you know, before the, 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 the end of the year. But as I said, the alternative is not at all good. So this would be a double reason why we are going to hurry up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, um, Prime Minister, um, you touched upon VAT collection and also some of the successes that according to uh, consulting reports, but also according to the European Commission, uh, were quite a success. So we, Poland managed to decrease the VAT gap. Um, but uh, there's a level of uh, of a gap that's always going to be is always going to be there uh, because some people make mistakes. Uh, there's a, not always a, a fraud in, in in such situations. But we still see on the European level. You said about 150 billion euros um, being missing. Uh, some say, as the IFO Institute in Germany, that uh, 64 billion is uh, um, strictly connected with fraud uh, in terms of the money being um, uh, being missing in the European countries. Uh, what more can be done on the European or even OECD level in order to decrease the, the VAT or European VAT gap? I, I think that we should um, harmonize approach to eliminate the VAT frauds, VAT carousel frauds. Um, according to uh, 35 dailies, I think um, a very thorough analysis made on fraudulent uh, transactions and VAT carousels um, across Europe is uh, indicating uh, another figure of 65 billion euro missing solely on uh, in this in this very area, VAT carousels. So uh, 
whether we speak about the total figure of 150, which is a figure presented by the Euro European Commission, by the way, or 65 billion euro financing mafias and terrorists, uh, everybody would agree in this room and every decent citizens, uh, citizen of the European Union w would agree that we have to deal with this. This is the elephant in the room. Um, and, and here I, I would agree with um, Bruno that we have to work common solutions for uh, in, in those different areas. Um, the moment we agree uh, what's the problem, how to define the problem, um, and the problem in corporate income tax, to, 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 to make a little digression, is, is not only uh, the rates, tax rates, but also different schemes, different um, legal actions which are behind the rates, uh, which allow companies not to pay taxes. Angel mentioned about this a little bit, um, saying what is legal, what is illegal, which is very tr pretty tricky because they rich companies and big guys of those, this world, they hire uh, the best lawyers and they, uh, they do this quite often in a legal or half-legal way. So, uh, Poland would be ready to, be, to, to take very brave actions together with other member states of the European Union in all sorts of different um, irregularities. Grey area, black market, VAT frauds, um, um, tax evasion, tax abuse in the area of personal income tax or corporate income tax. And I think uh, what's today uh, completely um, different than it used to be four or five years ago when I started to, um, to get immersed in, in those topics. And this is, by the way, thanks to Angel and thanks to the position of France and Germany. Uh, like Angela Merkel once said that it's not normal that a shop around the corner pays higher taxes than the, uh, in Germany than uh, a big corporation. It, it is not normal. It, is not, it should not be acceptable. Okay? So thanks to, the change, thanks to the discussions like this one today, thanks to the reports like, like, like yours, Piotr, and, and, the, and the, a thorough analysis which were made in OECD by the European Commission, we today understand what is the extent of this of this problem. And this is a very good starting point to, um, to address this really seriously. And Poland is, is ready to, to do uh, uh, our part to, and to, 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 to change our system, to do whatever needs to be done to eliminate all those frauds, irregularities, and so on. And, and this is so important for the uh, not only for, for the institutions, for the, for, the, for the budgetary issues of the, of the EU, but I like the point which um, uh, Minister uh, Le Maire Bruno made, the social dimension of this, the populism, and so on. This is so important. I couldn't agree more with you, uh, Bruno, on this. I, I think it's, 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 it's spot on um, uh, how important this is for the, for the feeling of being treated in a just way. And this is very important for all 500 million citizens of the European Union. So, so Poland will be very much, uh, you know, at the forefront of making changes to um, a, a more just uh, and and equal um, taxation system in, the, in Europe. Thank you very much. And one one last question before we start a, a short Q and A session, because I promised you that. Um, um, uh, about digital tax. Uh, we got to know this week that uh, France and the United States managed to cut some kind of deal uh, between them on digital taxation, but France was and still is a digital tax champion in the EU and also in the world with uh, some interesting solution to the problem because it's different from other proposals on the market, if I may say so. Um, so, if you may say just a few words, uh, how it's going to look like in the near future, and uh, how you know how how France is proposing the reforms of uh, digital taxation in the European yes, Union. Very quickly, we want to remain 
the champion on this new international taxation system, including digital taxation. But President Macron has always been very clear. We want an international solution. And that's very good news to listen to the view of uh, the American Senate today when we uh, announced that we were not far from an agreement with uh, Stephen Mnuchin. Uh, the statement of the American Senate was supporting the idea of getting a compromise on digital taxation at the international level. So I really think that France has played its role in pushing an international solution, in giving an impetus to that question. Because, you know, when you are talking about international issue, the key question is the awareness of the people is to make the people aware of the issue, aware of the problem. And that's exactly the role that France played over the last three years about that question of digital taxation. We made clear that there was a problem and that nobody could accept to have the biggest companies paying less taxes than the smallest one just because they do not have any physical presence on our territories. Then on the agreement we are working on, it's a very simple one, France will accept to postpone the payment of the national taxation by the companies during the year 2020. Normally the payment should have been made in April. We are ready to postpone the payment till December. But I want to be very clear, no suspension of the French taxation, no withdrawal of the French taxation. Either there is an international agreement at the end of 2020, and in that case, the international agreement will replace our national taxation, or there is no agreement at the OECD, and in that case, since the French taxation remains in place, the companies will have to pay. In any case, digital companies in France will have to pay their due taxes in 2020. It must be clear for everybody. The second point of the agreement is that the US have accepted during the time of the negotiation to suspend their sanctions against France. I think that's very good news because entering into a trade war between the US and Europe about digital taxation would be really an economic and a political mistake. And the third point of the agreement is to agree on working on a final solution on a definitive agreement on digital taxation at the OECD level. We just need to be very clear and very specific about the basis of the negotiation, and that's why we will have a new meeting tomorrow morning with uh, Stephen Minushin, Angel Goya, and myself to have a starting point for the international negotiation, which is a solid one. Because I don't want to have something that uh, would not be clear or that would not be uh, efficient or solid. We want a solid starting point, and that's why we will have a, a very last meeting tomorrow morning. But frankly speaking, I think that we have made 80% of uh, our road to a final agreement on digital taxation, and that's good news. Thank you very much. Now the promised Q&A session, so everybody who wants to ask a question, please raise your hands. I think we have time for how many? Three? Three questions. Okay. Hello, my name is Mateusz Walewski. I'm chief economist of BGK, the Polish Development Bank, and a partner of this uh, of this uh, event. Uh, we know that you uh, said that OECD is very advanced in its works on uh, uh, on reforming corporate income tax system around the world, but we also know that there, there is a history of EU works on on the same issue. There is a history of uh, common corporate consolidated tax base uh, idea. It was it stuck somewhere in 2016, as, I, uh, as far as I remember. Uh, what do you think? Should do you think that the EU should continue its works on uh, on these solutions, or should it be left on international OECD level, or should uh, EU try to somehow copy American solutions, such as Beats, for example? What 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 what, what should EU do, or sh should it be only in OECD hands, or should EU do also something about it? Okay, thank you. I guess it's. Whoever wants to answer is to open. Okay, 
A very quick response to, to just underline that we are very much in favor of a com common corporate tax rate within the EU. I just want to refer to the Messeberg agreement between Angela Merkel and Emmanuel Macron, uh, where you have this purpose of getting as soon as possible to a common corporate tax rate. And we are working very hard on that. And I think that Poland will be key because Poland is now one of the biggest and most important country from both political and economic point of view in Europe. You know that President Macron will be visiting um, Poland in a few days. That's very important for us. You know that I'm maybe the strongest advocate for the uh, improvement of the friendship and the relationship between Poland and France because I think it's key and uh, it uh, also meets the history and the memory of our two countries. And I hope that during the visit of President Macron to uh, Poland, we can register some uh, progress on that issue too. Thank you very much. Other questions? Nobody, really? Violent objections? <laughs> Nobody objects? Everybody wants to have ta no tax havens? You know, it's Davos. You, 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 you could oppose a bit, uh, I guess. Okay, there's one question. Uh, good evening, Jan Olenski, Radio Vnet. Um, this might be a little bit of topic, um, but still um, regarding taxes, uh, President Donald Trump vowed today to make good on threats to impose the high tariffs on European cars if the bloc doesn't agree to a long t delayed uh, trade deal with Washington. So uh, how will you respond to this announcement by the President of the United States? Well, Poland does produce French cars, so, <laughs> so I... Uh, there to try to answer. I, I think that the first thing which needs to be taken into account is that President Trump is, uh, has elections towards the end of this year. Uh, that's item number one. Item number two is that um, I think that uh, the example of how France and the United States negotiated the digital tax uh, taxation and the approach to this is is very good. It's uh, based on compromise, on sensible uh, solutions. And I truly believe that there is a, um, a potentially mutually beneficial deal to be struck between the United States and um, the European Union. I, I don't want to um, sound like escaping this topic, but I, I, I think it's very relevant what, what I'm going to say, even if this is not about the United States, not about the European Union. But this is based on experience on, of many companies which, are, which I talk to. And this is uh, our friends from China. Uh, everybody who thinks that like France is protectionist, or Poland is protectionist, or, or the United States is protectionist, ask entrepreneurs which market is the most difficult to enter to and you will always hear China Japan I just came from Japan I have lots of Japanese friends but but this is this is these are the facts which I quote from our uh, entrepreneurs from our um, CEOs uh, so the United States and the European Union talking about tariffs. Yes, we might have somehow t slightly higher tariffs on this. These goods, uh, they have uh, higher tariffs of the, uh, on the other goods. I happen to be um, immersed in the European law some time ago, 25 years ago. And in Europe, for many, many years, we are not talking about tariffs anymore. We talk about non-tariff barriers. And in China, I can tell you, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning China because this is such a global power, such an important player in the world, that uh, we have to really deal with the um, uh, protectionist measures. And I'm not so much worried about, now I go back to the main vein of, of, of your question, I'm not worried about tariffs between the United States and Europe. I'm, I'm sure President Macron ourselves and, and, and the European Commission, we, we, will, we will find a way. The, the average tariffs in the, U, in the US is 3.4%. Uh, average tariffs in, uh, in Europe, it's 
four and a half percent. So yes, in Europe we have slightly higher tariffs on average than the United States, but th this is neither here nor there in the overall context. Ask people, entrepreneurs, producing this or that good, uh, who want to export this good, which market is most difficult to enter to? French, Polish, American, German, or Chinese, or Japanese? You will, 90% of those cases, you will receive an uh, answer that the most difficult market to get to is the Chinese market, or the, I don't know, those markets around in the, in the far, far east. So our markets, American market, I mean the European markets, are quite open. And by the way, we didn't discuss climate, but uh, Poland is in favor of Green Deal, climate neutrality, and all sorts of those things. But provided that we are not losing all the automotive sector from France, steel sector from Germany and from France, to China and to Russia, because there is huge carbon leakage. And this is another dimension of taxation. Uh, this is ETS system in Europe is an indirect taxation system. So we have to have a level playing field vis-a-vis -vis all those other players, including Russia and China. And this is for me much more difficult and much more important problem than this one percentage point of difference in tariffs on average between the United States and Europe. I'm, I'm uh, positive we'll find a a deal, we will strike a deal with President Trump with the United States over the next 6, 12, 18 months. Uh, I'm, I think there will be a much longer battle, much longer discussion with China, Japan and the others about different hidden protectionist measures in those markets. Thank you very much. We went from taxation, tax havens to trade. So, great. Thank you, everybody, for staying here. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister, Secretary General, and Minister.